Ever wondered how JSP directives work in web engineering? Well, let's unravel this mystery together. Java Server Pages, or JSP directives for short, are special instructions that control various aspects of the JSP environment and the generated servlet code. They're like the stage directors of a theatrical play, setting the scene and directing the actors, ensuring everything runs smoothly. Now, there are three main actors on this stage, the page directive, the include directive, and the tag lib directive. Each of them has a unique role to play in managing JSP page properties, dependencies, and external libraries. The page directive, for instance, sets global attributes for the page, influencing elements like import statements and error handling. Meanwhile, the include directive pulls in content from other files during compilation, and the tag lib directive manages external libraries. Each directive holds a crucial piece of the puzzle that is web engineering. Let's dive into the details of each one of these directives, shall we? First up, let's talk about page directives. Page directives are used to define global attributes for the Java Server Pages, or JSP page. They influence characteristics such as import statements, content type, error handling, and more. Think of them as the settings controller for your JSP page. The syntax for the page directive is quite straightforward. It simply looks like this. Less than symbol, percent sign, at symbol, the word page, your attribute equals sign, your value in quotes, percent sign, greater than symbol. Now, let's dive into some common attributes used with the page directive. Firstly, we have the import attribute. This specifies Java classes or packages to import. This is similar to import statements in Java, you can import multiple classes or packages by separating them with commas. For example, you might need to import the Java, util and java.io packages for your JSP page. Next, we have the content type attribute. This sets the content type for the HTTP response. It can define the MIME type and character encoding. For instance, to set the content type to text or HTML and the character encoding to UTF-8, you would use this attribute. The session attribute determines whether the JSP page participates in session management. If set to false, the page does not create or use HTTP sessions. So if you want your JSP page to participate in session management, you would set this attribute to true. The error page attribute specifies a JSP page to redirect to if an unhandled exception occurs. For instance, you might have a custom error page named error JSP that you want to redirect users to in the event of an error. The is error page attribute indicates if the current JSP page is designed to handle errors. If set to true, it can access the exception object with exception. This is useful if you want your JSP page to handle errors and exceptions itself. The is thread safe attribute determines if the JSP page is thread safe. If set to false, the JSP container will serialize requests to ensure thread safety. However, if you're confident that your JSP page is thread safe, you can set this attribute to true. The language attribute specifies the scripting language for the JSP page. Typically, it's set to Java because, well, we're working with Java server pages. Finally, the extends attribute allows the JSP generated servlet to extend a custom class. This can be handy when you want to inherit the properties and methods of a custom class in your JSP page. And there you have it. Page directives provide the foundation for how your JSP page behaves. They're the ground rules, the settings, the base upon which you build the rest of your JSP page. Understanding how to use them effectively can greatly enhance your web development process. Opening. Next, we have the include directives. Include directives play a significant role in the JSP world. They are used to incorporate the content of another file when the JSP page is being compiled. This is quite different from the action, which includes content only at runtime. Let's delve into why include directives are so invaluable. Picture this. You're working on a large project with multiple JSP pages, and you have certain sections like headers, footers, or shared scripts that are common across all these pages. Instead of copying and pasting the same code onto each page, which can be time-consuming and error-prone, you can use include directives to reuse these sections. This not only saves time but also helps maintain consistency across all your pages. The syntax for the include directive is quite straightforward. It starts with percent at include, followed by the file attribute, which specifies the relative path to the file to be included. The directive is then closed with percent. Here's an example. 
percented include file tweed header .sp percent. In this case, the content of the file header .jsp will be included at the location of the directive during the compilation of the JSP page. The included file essentially becomes part of the compiled JSP survey. This guarantees a single source of inclusion, making your code easier to manage and debug. It's worth noting that any changes made to the included file will require a recompilation of the JSP page for the changes to take effect. Include directives are not just limited to including static content. They can also include dynamic content or code that can be executed. For instance, you could include a file that contains a scriptlet or an expression, which will then be executed when the JSP page is requested. In essence, include directives are a vital tool in your JSP toolkit. They promote code reuse, help maintain consistency, and ultimately make your JSP pages more efficient and manageable. Ending. Include directives are an effective way to reuse code and keep your pages dry, don't repeat yourself. Finally, we come to taglib directives. Taglib directives are the special instructions in Java Server Pages, or JSP, that allow us to incorporate custom tags and tag libraries in our JSP files. It's like having your own set of personalized tools in your coding toolbox which you can pull out and use as needed. Let's dive into the details. Taglib directives are used to define a tag library, which is essentially a collection of custom tags. These custom tags can be used to simplify the JSP code, enhance its functionality, and make it more readable and maintainable. The syntax to use a taglib directive is as follows. Percent at taglib yuri yuri prefix prefix percent. In this syntax, URI stands for the Uniform Resource Identifier, which is used to locate the tag library descriptor, and prefix is a shorthand name that you choose to represent the tag library in your JSP code. For example, if you have a tag library for processing forms, and you want to use the prefix form, you can define the taglib directive like this. Percent at taglib URI cow web inform.tld prefix form percent. Once you've done this, you can use the form prefix to call any custom tag from the form tag library, like this. Taglib directives also allow us to use standard tag libraries, such as JSTL or Java standard tag library. JSTL is a collection of tags that can perform common tasks like iteration, conditional checks, and data formatting. To use JSTL in your JSP page, you can define a taglib directive like this. Percent at taglib URI equals sign prefix percent. And then, you can use JSTL tags in your JSP code like this. With taglib directives, you can extend the capabilities of your JSP pages with custom tags. So go ahead and explore the power of taglib directives to make your web development journey smoother and more efficient. So, we've covered all three types of JSP directives. Let's take a moment to reflect on what we've learned. We began with the concept of Java Server Pages directives, which are special instructions that control various aspects of the JSP environment and the generated servlet code. They offer a way to define global settings and shape the behavior of the JSP page at its very core. Next, we dove into the page directive, which is used to define global attributes for the JSP page. We learned that it influences attributes like import statements, content type, error handling, and more. And we saw how it can be used to specify Java classes or packages to import set the content type for the HTTP response, determine whether the JSP page participates in session management, and much more. Then we explored the include directive, which allows the content of another file to be included when the JSP page is compiled. This feature is particularly useful for reusing common parts across multiple JSP pages, such as headers, footers, or shared scripts. It ensures a single source of inclusion, fostering consistency across web pages. Lastly, we touched on the taglib directive. Although we didn't delve as deeply into this one, it's worth noting that the taglib directive is a powerful tool for managing libraries of custom tags, which can encapsulate complex behavior into reusable components. Remember, each directive serves a distinct purpose in managing JSP page properties, dependencies, and external libraries. They're processed by the JSP container during the page translation phase, before the actual servlet code is generated and executed. Understanding JSP directives is key to mastering web engineering with Java server pages. They provide the foundation for managing the behavior of your JSP pages and the generated servlet code. 
By harnessing the power of JSP directives, you can take control of your web development process and create more robust, efficient, and maintainable web applications. Stay tuned for more insights into the world of web development.